It's like everyone has these ideas. They look at history and they, they watch movies. They look at World War II and slavery. Like I would have freed the slaves and I would have had Jews from the Nazis or I'd be the good guys in Star Wars. Well, you actually wouldn't if you don't have the courage to even just speak right now. That's going along with it. And if you want to be remembered by your kids and grandkids as someone who did the right thing, you need to just dig deep right now and find that courage and start speaking up because otherwise you'll be looked back upon as a coward. This is it. This is where we draw the line and say no more. Hey, Joyful Warriors, Tiffany Justice here with the Joyful Warrior podcast from Moms for Liberty, and we are joined by a dad today. You all know that Moms for Liberty isn't just moms, it's dads and aunts and uncles and grandparents, and we know that uh, dads are incredibly important in their kids' lives. And so Harrison uh, recently was granted custody of his four-and-a-half-year-old son um, in California. He's from the Santa Cruz area, and he became aware of the fact that his son was being treated uh, by um, his son's mom as if the child was non-binary, and he wasn't okay with that. And so he's going to tell us a little bit about his story now. So uh, Harrison, it's very nice to meet you. Uh, you were smiling when we started this interview. No doubt you are happy and joyful in this moment because you are, you know, you have your son with you and you're able to, to help him to live his full life and unfold his full potential as a little boy. Um, but why don't you tell us uh, about your journey? Yeah, well, thank you so much for having me. I'm really happy to be here. And my journey starts, you know, years back, maybe five years ago. And I started dating this girl in the Bay Area. Uh, we, we fell in love. We never agreed politically. I always thought we could just look past that, but our country's just become so crazy polarized. And she got pregnant pretty quickly in our relationship in like just a few months. And thankfully, we, you know, we, she decided that that was okay, that we could have the baby, which I was extremely thankful since our differences in political view there. But um, we both found out it was a boy. We were extremely excited. We agreed upon a name. And you know, when she announced on social media that she was pregnant, she said, baby, Sawyer, due in December, I'll love you whether you're a boy or girl or neither. And that was kind of concerning. And from there, as her pregnancy went on, she just started to threaten me constantly. It seemed daily even that I wouldn't see my son if this or that, if I wasn't basically who she wanted me to be politically. And it just got to a point where she essentially broke up with me and sent me a cease and desist letter. And I didn't know when my son was born. Found out about a week later from social media, one of her friends reaching out to me. That was heartbreaking. And from there, I filed in court two months later. And it took 13 more months just to meet him. So I finally got to meet him when he was 15 months old, despite of knowing about him from pregnancy. And, you know, that was a really, really tough time in my life. But I fought through it. And I became stronger, better man to be a better dad for Sawyer and a better warrior in this fight against the war on children. And so I started doing visitation with him. Um, you know, it was just this absolutely beautiful and miraculous to look in his eyes for the first time and meet him. And I just felt I bet he was so happy to meet you. Yeah, it was crazy. It was just pure miracle frequency, magic in the air. And I, it just felt surreal and wonderful and magical. And yeah, we started doing our visits. I, you know, his mom and her parties tried to make it as hard as possible during my visits. There's things like people spying on us from the bushes and like cameras recording us and all this weird stuff. But I just kept my head up and just did my visits and fought through it. And I moved to the Bay Area a few months later and I got half custody basically right away. I'm super thankful for that. And... It was around the time that I got half custody that his mom started to seem to, at least publicly, start pretending he was non-binary. She was calling him Bay. She sometimes put him in dresses and makeup and weird things like that. And so you moved to the Bay Area. How old is your son at this point? One and a half. Okay. And so when you say, it's so crazy to me, I just, you know, you say non-binary, like how a yeah. child could express that at all, right? I mean, honestly, right. And so- that's kind of the question I just want to talk to you about. So you have joint custody now. He's coming and staying with you, I would imagine. And then he's with uh, your ex-girlfriend, we'll, call, we'll say his mom. And um, are you, you're, when you say, like, she's saying they, you're seeing that on social media, or he's coming over to you in your house and he has 
nail polish on or makeup on or a dress. I mean, he's one, one and a half. I'm trying to wrap my head around as a mom, you know, yeah, yeah. What, that, what that's like. Cause I didn't even like put jeans on my kids. Cause I was like, man, that seems uncomfortable. Like they're babies. <laughs> yeah, so yeah. I'm trying to understand right now. Like, yeah, it's a good question. So it was probably more on the lines of like 20 months old that this okay. was happening. I'd say not quite one and a half. So he was starting to talk as well, a lot better. And yeah, no, he didn't ever come home and believe any of this stuff. So he's never bought into this one time. I've never one time heard him express any desire to be non-binary or anything remotely in that realm. He's only expressed sadness and anger about his mom doing these sorts of things. So no, he never came home like that. It was just like my sister sending me pictures from social media, essentially, that I was getting this information from. And, you know, I mean... Did you try to talk? I, did you try to talk to his mom about it when you started seeing it? If I try to talk to his mom, it, it's usually not very good or productive. And I also had a restraining order. Okay. So I don't believe so. Um, I definitely brought it up to court, though. And... It was also a really scary incident. She was arrested during this time for child endangerment. What was the court's response when you would tell them, like, you know, I'm getting these pictures of my child dressed in opposite sex clothing, like, you know, traditional, you know, a dress or makeup or what have you. I mean, no one, again, no, no one puts their 20 month old. Yes. in a dress maybe, but no one's putting makeup on their 20 month old. I mean, just right in general, yeah. uh, that's an issue, but what was the court totally. receptive to your concerns or did they seem, I'm so curious about, cause you're in California and I know California is a little bit of a different place. Yeah. When well, in actually court, cause where she lives, it's San Francisco. So not even okay. Santa Cruz or anything like that's even, it's the heart of all of this. Okay. Uh, but they were neutral. So thankfully they didn't take her side in any way and at least, and they just said like, we're not going to rule on that. That's between you two. And like, that's not our place, which I, I at least respect to a degree. I think obviously the court should say that that's inappropriate and unacceptable, but you know, it's San Francisco. So I feel like it was at least, at least they were neutral. There was no medical that. intervention happening at the time. It was no, all just nothing like that. Stuff. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah, so there was this big arrest. And so I brought all these issues we're talking about and some other smaller ones to court. And I got granted a trial and it was a five day trial. It was four days originally and ended up being five. I was thankful for that. It seemed extremely one sided. Like we have all this evidence of these dangers and, you know, the gender stuff, et cetera. And I felt really confident about it. You know, witnesses, police officers, all these things. And it just afterwards, I waited a couple months and then I got the court decision and they decided that they were going to keep custody, you know, 50, 50, that they wouldn't rule on the gender thing. And yeah, I mean, it was just so devastating to hear that. I, I really felt like, how could you put a child back in that sort of environment? So I kind of decided that I have to do something and I decided I was going to come out publicly and I'm super thankful that the Daily Wire and Matt Walsh decided to break my story and when that happened, and that I was going to appeal this trial decision, I felt the court made the wrong decision. So, you know, they break my story. And then I just started doing interview after interview, uh, raising money for my appeal, raising awareness about this issue and about parental rights and protecting kids. And I just got to become part of this wonderful movement of parents and people, warriors standing up for children. And it's just opened up my life in so many incredible ways. I mean, I've just met some of the most amazing people and it just feels so great to have a purpose so important as protecting children. I really think there's a war on children and this is the battle of our lifetime. I went to the Capitol to fight crazy bills in California, like 957, which we got Newsom to veto even. And unfortunately they just signed, signed AB 1955. We can talk about that later on. It's a crazy bill, but to keep the story where we're at, um, you know, just all this going on for like the last year and then fighting as hard as I can. And I just get a call one day and I have, a, or I have a few missed calls from the police and they're saying I need to pick up my son. So I go and pick him up. And unfortunately there was another incident with his mom of violence that he had to bear witness to. It was really terrifying and not okay at all for a four year old to see. And I, he even took part in it. Um, in his words, at the instruction of his, his mother, she was having a physical altercation with her father, um, a very serious one. 
and he claims that she told him to take part in it. Or sorry, Sawyer claims that she told him to take part in it. She claims that he just did it on his own. But either way, I think that any normal adult would just tell the child to run away or something when they're four. Um, and that clearly didn't happen. So unfortunately, yeah, he had to witness some pretty brutal stuff. And I actually brought that to court and court denied my ex parte emergency temporary custody orders in spite of all of this. Hmm which was surprising, but thankfully CPS in San Francisco stepped up and they said, that's okay. We're not going to let him go back to that unsafe environment. Wow. Keeping him with you ourselves. Yeah. So CPS really are the heroes of this story. That's um, good to know. Yeah. I hear a lot of bad things about CPS and I'm sure some are true, but I can tell you there is also wonderful people in CPS, even in San Francisco, California. Yeah. You know, they put, and the mom, of course, during this, they did a very thorough investigation and I was extremely open with them. And his, you know, Sawyer's mom, of course, tried to lie about me and like paint me as whatever weird right wing silly stuff that has nothing to do with about the safety of a child and nothing to do with their investigation for that matter either. But they put politics aside. They didn't let that sway them. They just looked into what's the best interest of the child and what's safest for the child. And after a really long investigation and during it, they kept him with me safely and only let her have supervised visits professionally. And it got to the end right before the trial and they recommended full custody to me. And wow. we all came to an agreement right before trial. So mom and her attorney, me and my attorney, CPS and their attorney, and then Sawyer's appointed attorney. Three of us were in agreement that I should have full custody. And we ended up coming to a pretty great agreement before without having it go down to trial and I'm super thankful even to his mom for accepting this agreement. I was awarded full physical custody. We have split legal custody, but I have the final say if we don't agree, which is very important to me. And, you know, some alcohol drug testing, things like that for her. I won't get into it too much, but yeah, I, I think it was a really good conclusion for all of this. And it's definitely what's best for Sawyer. And I can just say in the last four months or so, he's just been just thriving. He just seems so to excel in such spectacular ways. And it just seems like he's having less temper tantrums and it just seems to be doing so well having a stable environment. Kids thrive on routine uh, without a doubt that stable home environment is so incredibly important to them. So you're right. I'm sure he is thriving. So you have spoken a couple times about, you know, having the different political belief systems or the, your political belief system was used against you. We know that in a lot yeah. of schools where there are secrets being kept from parents when kids are expressing gender confusion in school, um, that parents' political affiliations or beliefs or religious beliefs are being used against them uh, because they're saying the parent's belief system will hurt the child in some way or is somehow keeping the child from becoming their true self. Um, we spoke about abortion at the beginning of this conversation and the fact that, you know, there was some political differences. I'm curious, you're a California guy. Did you grow up in California? Yeah, I grew up in the Bay Area in California. So how, how do you think, and, and I'm going to ask you lots of personal questions now. How old are you? <laughs> I'm 32. Okay. So I'm 45. Um, <laughs> how, <laughs> how do you think these issues about like abortion, killing a baby, um, uh, or, um, the parental rights, um, and, and, you know, or, or mental illness in, in a child or, ex you know, confusion in a child. How have these things that seem to be just really human issues, how have they become so partisan, uh, and become like such political hot potatoes? Because people, especially in California, but likely everywhere, especially in government schools and social media, et cetera, are propagandized to believe these things to be so important to fundamentally as who they are as having the right to abortion or the right to kill another human being and that or that uh, you know somebody should choose their gender which is just an insane concept like look there's boys and girls and that's it well, like this is all insane i think it's just been a a big basically kind of woke mind virus that's been perpetuated on people and forced onto children and I think once they repeat a lie long enough, people start to believe it. So did you see the interview that Jordan Peterson did with Elon Musk about his, his daughter or his son, right, who has now transitioned to become a girl or thinks that he's a girl? I believe it's her, his son, Xavier, I think. Did you see that interview? Yeah, I saw it. It's heartbreaking, but it was so also inspiring to see someone like Elon Musk with that amount of 
power to step up over the crazy bill that demands, you know, schools keep secrets from parents. Um, you know, AB1955 that Newsom signed, which is evil. Um, but to see Elon Musk to be vulnerable and share that story and to even move his businesses out of California, I mean, that's the kind of statement that can really make a difference. And we need more people to step up and start speaking the truth, saying what they believe and protecting children. They're the most vulnerable, amazing, innocent amongst us in the future. There's no reason. This is the battle of our life. We need to protect the kids. And I'm so glad someone like Elon Musk is speaking the truth. So men have been pushed out when it comes to so many issues about kids and family. I feel like, you know, men have been silenced when we talk about abortion. Men have been told, you know, this issue of parenting or children uh, somehow it's just not your place, right? You don't need to worry about it. It's a woman's issue. Um, all of the stuff about biological sex and men and women's sports and all of these things, you know, um, I think feminists for a long time have said like men stay out of this. It isn't really your place to talk about it. Um, <laughs> have you seen that in your life? And I, you know, I was struck by Elon speaking out too, because you're right. He's here's this powerful, rich guy who can really do anything he wants, except save his kid from the same horrible woke mind virus that um, all of our kids are all susceptible to, right? There's nothing that really protects you. So let's hit on some of that if we could. I'd love to hear your thoughts. Yeah. Well, first of all, I think everyone at home who's just staying quiet, even though they know in their heart that this is wrong, if it can happen to Elon Musk, it can happen to you. And this stuff is, you know, being pushed on the kids everywhere, every state, every city in the country, every school, it's everywhere. It's not gonna stop unless we put a stop to it. So if you know in your heart that that is wrong, you need to dig deep and find some courage and start saying what you believe. It's like everyone has these ideas. They look at history and they, they watch movies. They look at World War II and slavery. Like I would have, I would have helped, you know, free the slaves and I would have had Jews from the Nazis or I'd be the good guys in Star Wars. And it's like, well, you actually wouldn't if you don't have the courage to even just speak right now. That's going along with it. And if you want to be remembered by your kids and grandkids as someone who did the right thing, you need to dig deep right now and find that courage and start speaking up. Because otherwise you'll be looked back upon as a coward. And I don't even think you'll be able to face yourself in the mirror to not stand up for children. I mean, it's just, this is it. This is where we draw the line and say no more. You think a lot of people don't realize how bad it actually is, what's actually happening. I feel like sometimes until it happens to people, right? And it's such a horrible thing to have happen to you. And I hear the horror stories, not only for the child and the parents, but the whole family. Gender ideology destroys families. It's such a self-loathing thing where the child is taught that the body they were born in is somehow broken or wrong. And it creates so much hate, self-hate. And so I, I, I'm just curious about that, what your thoughts on that. I just think that gender ideology should be nowhere near children. They have no interest in talking about sex or these radical ideas that are fictional. There's only boys and girls. I think kids even innately know that. When I asked Sawyer through this last you know, couple of years of this stuff, he was always able to identify whether someone was a boy or girl uh, with 100% accuracy, uh, even if they were like a tranny and even if it was a cartoon, he's always completely known what the truth is. It's just so apparent. And there's just, there's no such thing as a trans child. This stuff belongs nowhere near kids. They just want to have fun and learn and play and spend time with their parents, you know, be loved, learn, like te be taught things, be curious about the world. And you're just taking away this beautiful innocence that children have. And it's so wrong and it's not okay. And I, I don't understand how it's like at school, teachers are saying this stuff to, to kids and parents are just putting up with it. But these same parents, if they were at the park and some random guy started talking to their kids about sex and about gender identity, they would flip out. Yeah. And it's, it is no different and we're, we cannot put up with it any longer. No, I agree with you. I agree. And I just feel like, it, you know, in too many instances, it's like someone has to be personally touched by this issue in their family or in someone that they know in order to really see how harmful it is. So, um, you know, we're kind of caught in this battle of, you know, awareness, right? Where do we hit like critical mass awareness on the issue, but yet, you know, protect as many kids as possible. So you sharing your story is really important. I have a good friend, Kelly Shinkoski. Uh, she uh, is on uh, Twitter as Ke Kelly S-K-E. 
Um, and she uh, does uh, some work as a researcher underneath her website, A Time to Stand. And she has a joke she always says that she says, um, California isn't Vegas. What happens in California doesn't stay in California. And so uh, tell us a little bit about some of the most concerning policies that you've seen uh, being forwarded in California. And um, you mentioned, uh, you know, uh, Gavin Newsom vetoed one bill, but then what he uh, signed into law that AB 1955, that uh, law that says that schools can keep secrets from parents. So let's talk about not only the horrible bills in California, but the horrible hypocrisy of someone like Gavin Newsom and his complicit, uh, his, how complicit he is in, in forwarding gender ideology in California. And Kamala Harris too, by the way. Yeah, she started it all in San Francisco, if I recall correctly. But Gavin Newsom really seems like an evil person to me. You know, I don't know him personally. And I just don't understand what his intentions could possibly be. And even the senators and assembly members writing these bills, because I talk to parents and I live here and I literally do not know anyone who supports any of these anti-parent bills at all, whether they're a liberal or conservative or otherwise, but everyone's against it. I literally have not met in conversation someone who supports them. I'm sure there's a fringe amount of people in San Francisco or wherever, but I don't know who they're catering to. They're clearly not representing the people they're supposed to represent, which is their job. And, you know, these ideas are coming from everywhere. I think that, you know, TikTok pushes a lot of it onto kids. And I think that obviously schools and everything, but like there's so many bills too, like from there's 665, which allows kids to, um, you know, leave their parents' home and go to like a government home. And there's a, I believe California is a trans sanctuary state. Like you could flee from another state and take a kid here, which I believe is happening in Jeff Younger's case, even from Texas, even against a Texas order from family court. And now they're literally trying to mutilate his son at 12 years old, which is horrifying. And I think people need to look into that and try to help him as well as Adam Vina, who hasn't seen his son. But we're just seeing more of more of it. And I think people aren't understanding Like you asked me earlier and I don't believe I answered. Are people starting to see it or why aren't people seeing it? I think people are starting to wake up to it finally and see it more and more. I mean, to keep spreading the word, uh, like you said, though, they don't seem to have the courage to do anything about it until it touches them personally, but it will be there at your door unless you start to speak up now. Like how many kids have to be mutilated? How many times do you have to hear stories from, first of all, incredible, vulnerable, amazing people like Chloe Cole and Laura Becker, these detransitioners telling, spilling their heart out in spite of going through such horrible things. And you know, yep. Chloe Cole, just to take an example, is such a bright light. I mean, her spirit, I swear, is so bubbly and amazing and positive. I just really want to put that out there that in spite of what she's been through, she is an amazing person. And I really mean that. And if she can do that and have the courage to speak out about what she went through, you know, literally having her breast chopped off as a child, you can speak up and say that this is wrong and that we need to protect children. I think one of the most important things that you said was there's no such thing as a transgender child. I say it all the time. Almost every interview I do, it rarely gets printed, Harrison. Um, I do a lot of, you know, I do background for different journalists, but then I do a lot of interviews and I always say, there's, you know, they say, well, what about the other side? And I, and, and what about their safety? I always say there's no such thing as a transgender child. And these children are, are suffering mental distress. And the government doesn't have the right to keep that mental distress from a parent. That's when they, the child needs the parent the very most of any time in their lives. And so, um, you know, I, I think that there's no such thing as a transgender child. We need to stop agreeing to start the conversation like there's some acknowledgement that is something other than a boy or a girl exists um, and, and giving power to, and p giving people the power and the tools to really message on that. So what are you doing now? Um, as far as sharing your message? Are you speaking around California? I know you've done a lot of interviews. Um, what's the future look like for you? I plan on doing everything I can to protect kids from this gender insanity. Yeah, I'm doing as many interviews as I possibly can, like four a day or as many as you know people ask me to do. I plan on going to the Capitol to fight more crazy bills. Someone actually called me today to ask me to speak at the Capitol. Um, definitely spreading awareness. I'd be interested in, you know, starting, um, you know, some sort of movement or organization to protect kids specifically from this madness. You know, I think that that'd be a really incredible thing to have. There is amazing, you know, groups like Dad Army, 
that I'm a part of in our duty. Mm-hmm. And we just have to keep speaking the truth and just say, like, this is it. This is our line in the sand. We're not letting you harm children anymore. There is no such thing as a transgender child. There's boys and girls, and that's all. And especially, like, when we're talking about kids that are two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, like, that is literally insane. There is no world like that you could even try to conceive that you should be talking to them about that or pretending there's something they're not. They tell you that they're Spider-Man. Right. Or even sexual orientation. Like the idea, yeah. it, can it, can a person, is a person born and they know that they're gay? I know there are many people who are gay that said they've known their whole lives they were gay. But do you talk, why would you need to talk to a child that's eight about being gay or straight anymore, like being gay, any more than you would talk to that child about being straight? Why are we talking to children about sex at all. Don't you like ask yourself that question? <laughs> like what is going on? Yeah, exactly. On? Exactly. It's, it's such an inappropriate conversation to have with a child and unless you're trying to sway them into something. I mean, I think a right. lot of parents literally want to show off their gay or trans kid as like their Gucci handbag on social right. media. And that's just such a narcissistic, horrible thing to do. Is sacrificing your child for your own fake, you know, idea of being a good person on social media like that is just so wrong and yeah it has no no place we, we don't talk to kids about that you know let them just grow up and be kids 100 percent. so do, are you seeing that more people in california are watching and seeing what's happening in europe and england with the cast review are, are people becoming more aware that there's a lot of research showing that this so-called gender affirming care is it helpful for kids well, I, I really hope so. I'm trying to spread the word. The CAS files are incredible. The WPATH files, you know, all these things, all the countries that have banned it, all the states that have banned it. And yet, you know, America and Canada, as far as I can tell, are the only ones really pushing on with this. Yep. And it needs to stop. Why are we not listening to the evidence that, you know, completely demolishes their fake ideas? Like, oh, would you rather have a trans kid or a dead kid? Like, well, that's actually the opposite of the truth. So sorry, we're not living in 1984 anymore. Uh, We're going to speak the truth and you're not going to cut off healthy body parts of children, particularly their most important body parts. I mean, if your kid says they're a pirate, we don't chop off their leg and poke their eye out and give them an eye patch and a little peg leg. Do they say that they're Spider-Man? You don't take them on the buildings in New York and be like, okay, let's swing across them. And this is the only thing for some reason that we're pretending is okay. Like kids have imaginations and it's just demented. Like we don't let them get tattoos, drink alcohol, et cetera, make any big life changing decisions, but you're going to chop off their body parts. I like, said I, the other day, I said, you know, if it was, if, if non-binary, the idea of non-binary, because I think uh, Beth Bourne, who's our chapter chair uh, out in California, Yolo <laughs> County, Beth said something about, um, I think it's something like seven or 8% of the kids, and maybe it's Davis, uh, in, in Davis County schools are considered themselves to be non-binary. And I said, I I posted something like about the fact that if non-binary was like goth, right? If it was just like a stage that kids could go through, then it wouldn't really be that big of a deal because you'd be like, okay, well, they're immature and, you know, they're going to dress like this or whatever. And, you know, I mean, I've got lots of friends who dress lots of different ways when we were growing up and, you know, they grew out of it, right? But non-binary or gender ideology in general isn't irreversible all the time. It puts kids on this track. Where, you know, people say, well, what's the big deal? You just use the pronouns. What's the big deal, right? So just, you know, I want to, in closing out for parents, what was the big deal to you? You know, you and I have talked a little bit about the difference between, you know, gender, uh, between the idea of a child being transitioned or being non-binary. But what was it that struck you as a dad so clearly that this was so wrong? I mean, I'm able to just look at the situation and I know in my heart in my mind that it is wrong to tell children that there's something they're not, to not let them be happy with who they are. That's deeply disturbing. That's deeply incorrect. And it's like your example you gave, you know, oh, why wouldn't we just let them? It's like, okay, well, if you had an anorexic daughter, let's say, would you tell her that she's fat and tell her not to eat dinner in that situation? Like, I'm just trying to understand because that's your own logic. Is that what you're saying is the appropriate thing to do? When else do we affirm a delusion? And whoever said affirming a delusion is helpful in any way? I mean, according to the psychology, I don't believe it is. And yeah, I mean, look, there's boys and girls. I know that. I think it's not only just a fact of life. I think it's the most beautiful one because boys and girls complement each other so well. And let's not take that away from children. Let's live in truth. Let's live in love. 
Let's protect kids. This is insane. Okay, so the last question is this, sir. Um, if there's a dad that's listening to this and they're struggling, one of the things, the custody situations have been incredibly difficult. Moms for Liberty has been able to get people help uh, dealing with a lot of different legal issues. But once it starts getting into custody, it becomes much messier and much harder, as you well know. Um, so for dads who are struggling right now, perhaps this is happening with their child or they fear that it's happening, um, some, some advice for them on how to move forward. You have a duty as a dad to do whatever it takes to fight for your child. I don't care how dark it seems, how small the odds seem. You have to literally fight for your child's life. Even if you were to fail, you'll at least be able to look back and say that you did everything you could. There wasn't one more thing you could have done for your kid. I don't care how much money it costs. I don't care how much pain it puts you through, how much anxiety. You have to suffer for your child. You have to do what's right. Things are always darkest just before the dawn. I got a phone call out of the blue. Come pick my son up. I would have never guessed that. I had no idea. You cannot give up. We are in this moment in history where we say no more. We can beat this. This is wrong. It's like the sun is going to shine through the darkness. Good is going to beat evil. We can do this. We are that. This is our World War II moment or whatever you want to call it. And your child needs you and you need to be there for them. I think that's excellent advice, Harrison. It has been a pleasure talking to you. And I'll just remind our listeners, I say uh, to our moms and our chapter chairs all the time, that the fight is always going to be hardest before we win. It's not going to get easier and easier. It's going to get harder. Um, but we have to win this for our kids. There is no future in our children being told they were born in the wrong body or somehow the color of their skin keeps them from being able to do something in life or, or somehow there's a, an oppressed oppressor matrix uh, that they somehow need to fit on and are, are stuck on that for the rest of their lives. We need to give our kids the opportunity to become whoever it is they're supposed to be and to love them and to do that uh, and to, in a healthy and positive way. Um, so Harrison, Thank you for joining us. Uh, it was a pleasure talking to you. I'm so happy for Sawyer that he's in a good, safe, uh, stable environment now. I have no doubt that he's going to have a great life. Uh, and we appreciate you um, reminding dads that they need to do everything they can to get in the fight and help protect their kids. Thank you so much for having me. Or for having me. This is the battle of our lifetime. Save the kids. Be brave. How do people follow you if they want to keep in touch with you and, and watch what you're up to in your advocacy? You should be able to find me on all social media, Harrison Tinsley. It should come right up. I have a give, send, go slash saving Sawyer to help for, if, you know, Sawyer's mom files against me or if we want to move out of California, start this, you know, movement organization to help kids in similar situations. And I really do plan on giving it everything I have to protect children. Awesome. Thank you so much, Harrison. All right, Joyful Warriors, join us next time. Thanks so much for listening.